the last lecture, we described the Minoan civilization of Crete. And at the end, I said that the Minoan civilization collapsed in the face of a takeover by the Mycenaean civilization of the Greek mainlands, that the gravity of civilization shifted from the Aegean to Greece itself. In this lecture, I'm going to take the story a little stage further and look at the Mycenaean civilization and the Hittite civilization of Turkey and the world of international trade which developed in the eastern Mediterranean in the late second millennium BC. The period of time here isn't long, just several centuries, but it was a period of immense importance to the ancient world. First, I'm going to survey Mycenaean civilization with its palaces and small states, a society of warriors and traders, which took over where Mycenaean civilization had once flourished. From Greece, I'm going to move to the eastern Mediterranean, where the Hittites, as we said two lectures ago, vied with the Egypt and Mitanni for control of the lucrative trade routes of the eastern Mediterranean coast, the Levant. Then, which is unusual for this course, we'll describe the remarkable finds from a single site, the Ulu Burun shipwreck of southern Turkey, which contained a rich cargo from nine different areas of the eastern Mediterranean world. And finally, we'll discuss the collapse of this world in AD 1200, a collapse which effectively ended the era of the earliest civilizations in this pivotal part of the world. The German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann, who achieved international fame for his discovery of ancient Troy, his claimed discovery, because in fact he wasn't the first person to find it, of the mound of Hisselik up by the Dardanelles, was the first person to excavate at the rock-girt citadel of Mycenae in southern Greece. He excavated there from 1876 to 1877. Excavations which yielded spectacular chiefly burials adorned with golden masks, all of them interred inside a circular area within the fortifications of the citadel. Schliemann claimed, because he had an obsession with Homer, that the burials were those of King Agamemnon, the king who conquered Troy, and the burials were also those of other Homeric heroes. His finds caused an international sensation. Kings followed his excavations. But we now know that what he had actually unearthed was a much earlier society, that of the Mycenaean civilization, which flourished about 300 years earlier than the time described in Homer's epics. This was a remarkable civilization, despite its lack of connections with Homer. It was a Bronze Age civilization, adapted to the precipitous landscape of mainland Greece, which made ideal terrain not for the development of large, uniform states like Egypt, but for small, autonomous states. You see, the mountains break the terrain into small, fertile valleys, which formed the focus of different kingdoms. Now these kingdoms first became visible around 2000 BC, at about the time the first palace was built at Knossos. And this was a time, as we saw with the Minoans, of the expansion of long-distance trade in the Aegean and throughout the eastern Mediterranean. But on the mainland, much of the trade was of a different area. It was trade to the north, because Mycenae lay at the ultimate edge of temperate Europe. Among the commodities which passed north from the north into the Mediterranean world were lumps of amber, prehistoric resin which rubbed had magical properties. Soon, rich grave goods proclaimed the presence of a small, wealthy elite among the Mycenaeans. By 1600 BC, 
Full Mycenaean civilization developed at the time when Minoan civilization was at its height in Crete. It should be noted at once that the Mycenaeans owed much to the Minoans, including their writing system, Linear B, which developed out of earlier Cretan scripts, a script Linear B which has been partially deciphered, which allows us to get some insight to the volume of trade and the transactions that took place at major Mycenaean palaces, among them Pylos in the western Peloponnese of southern Greece. Like the Minoans, and there were some similarities here, Mycenaean rulers based themselves on imposing citadels. The major ones were at Mycenae in the eastern Peloponnese, at Pylos in the west, and at Tiryns, which lay on the plain of Argos, close to the modern town of Napoleon. Mycenae and Tiryns are remarkable for their massive fortifications, built of large, coastly filtered boulders, and also for their imposing gateway defenses, defenses against archers. In contrast, Pylos on the west coast was apparently unfortified, as if the region was more peaceful than the Aegean coast and hinterland. But this need for defence seems to have escalated in the 13th century, when the defences at both Mycenae and Tiryns were expanded significantly. To what extent does Homer's Iliad and Odyssey reflect the Mycenaean world? We've got to be very careful here, because there is this 300-year time gap between the possible date of Homer and Mycenae. But clearly there were some similarities. This was a society where wealth in goods and bravery in war and aggressive leadership were clearly important qualities for leaders. We know from Homer's descriptions that palaces at the time, like Mycenaean palaces, were centered around a central hall with a raised hearth known as a megaron. A megaron. The best preserved at Pylos, was lavishly decorated with painted wall friezes and may have had a second mud brick story above. Now, like Knossos, the palaces of the Mycenaeans were administrative centers of small kingdoms with storerooms for agricultural produce and luxury manufactures. The rulers also acquired wealth from taxes imposed on rural communities around their palaces, within their territories. Such Linear B tablets as have been deciphered include references to bronze weapons and vessels, to female textile workers, and to metalwork and perfume and other artisans who made all kinds of luxury products, as if the palaces were also major craft centers. This was a world where each ruler controlled local production, where each ruler lived in considerable luxury. For example, there were references in the Pylos tablets to ebony chairs, and ebony came from Egypt inlaid with ivory and gold. This was not a poor civilization. And it was also a civilization of considerable technological skill. The gold ornaments are magnificent. The Mycenaeans also were expert engineers. At Mycenae, they built a network of paved roads with bridges and culverts around the citadel, as well as large dams for storing water and canals to divert winter floodwaters. There's another similarity with Homer. Mycenaean civilization is remarkable for the weapons of war which are so prominent in the art and in the inventory. Shields, spears, swords, chariots, and these chariots may have served as mobile archery platforms. So they were warriors, and much of the warfare must have involved competition between different kingdoms. This was a world of constant 
ebbing and flowing alliances, rather like Sumerian city-states. This was not a stable environment politically, but one where people were vying for power and prestige and control of trade and so on. Because you see, like the Minoans, the Mycenaeans were aggressive traders who maintained a large fleet of merchant vessels. We know this because of discoveries of Mycenaean painted vessels and other containers in locales as far distant from Greece as Egypt, the Levant, and Cyprus. Many of these vessels were small painted containers which once held, we know from analysis, perfumed oils. Analysis of the constituents of the pottery clays using spectrographic analysis show that most of the pots came from the plain of Argos in southern Greece, close to Mycenae, and as I said, the modern city of Napleon. But Mycenaean ships ranged widely. They traveled constantly to the eastern Mediterranean, and also to the west, to Sicily, southern Italy, Sardinia, even as far as Malta, and perhaps even southern Spain. In Sardinia, the Mycenaeans were seeking copper, but most Mycenaean trade was within the confines of the Aegean Sea, and apparently included the transport of slaves, a first. In about 1200 BC, Mycenaean civilization collapsed. The great palaces were abandoned. New fortifications appear at Mycenaean Tiryns. Pylos was burnt to the ground. This, as we saw in the last Egyptian lecture, was a period of international and political change and turmoil. Trade contracted. Even Egypt was attacked by the roaming sea peoples. And in this cataclysm of change, the Mycenaeans vanished into historical obscurity. While the Mycenaeans prospered on the Greek mainland, the Hittite civilization of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, rose to prominence in the eastern Mediterranean after 1650 BC and rapidly extended its power into the Levant, where its armies, as we heard, competed with those of Mitanni east of the Euphrates and Egypt. And as we saw, Ramesses II and the Hittites divided the Levant between them in a memorable treaty, a treaty that held until the collapse of Hittite civilization at the hands of invaders from the north, somewhere around 1200 BC, this period of chaos. Mycenaean civilization was an integral part of this ever more complex eastern Mediterranean world where distant lands were linked by seaborne trade routes over many centuries. This trade was the lubricant of an ever more complex world. We know of this maritime world as a result of occasional fortunate archaeological discoveries of ancient shipwrecks. In AD 13, BC 1310, the date is known from the treeving dates from the ship's timbers, a heavily laden merchant ship sank off the Uluburin Peninsula in southern Turkey, taking a rich cargo with her. It seems she may have been cast on the rocks by a sudden southwesterly squall. Underwater archaeologists George Bass and Kemal Pulak have dissected this ship in an extraordinarily masterly excavation, the wreck lying more than 90 feet below the surface. And they've put together an extraordinary portrait of a truly exceptional cargo. And by sourcing the origins of the cargo, they have been able to reconstruct a voyage which apparently began on the Levant coast. The ship may have been of Canaanite or possibly Syrian origin.
She coasted her way west in the classic anti-clockwise pattern of the trade, which would take a merchant ship to the Aegean, then across to Egypt, and then up the eastern Mediterranean shore. What was remarkable about this ship, however, was the wealth of the cargo she carried. She was very heavily laden. For a start, she carried over 350 copper ingots. Each of these ingots weighed about 60 pounds. The total load was 10 tons, sufficient to equip a small army with weapons and armor. Imagine the value of that cargo. The copper has been sourced spectrographically to Cyprus. In addition, there were ingots of tin. And as we saw in an earlier lecture, the alloying of tin and copper makes bronze. And bronze is an important strategic metal because of the toughness of its working edges. And the ingots of tin aboard the ship have been sourced to Turkey. That tin was more valuable than copper, simply because the outcrops of it are very rare. So just on the metals alone, this cargo was extraordinary. There was a lot more. There were dozens of blue glass ingots of a type which we know were made in the city of Tyre, again on the Levant. These sorts of ingots, we also know, were much in demand in Egypt. And it appears that this cargo ultimately was destined for the Nile. In addition, the ship carried a ton of resin, which was in two-handled jars. Egyptian records tell us that this incense was, resin was used as incense in rituals along the Nile. Again, an Egyptian destination. But this is only the beginning. The cargo also included hardwoods. Baltic amber from northern Europe, much prized for its magical properties and a rare commodity. Elephant tusks probably from Syria or somewhere like that, because at that time, elephants thrived in that region. Tortoise shells. And then large jars containing stacks of Canaanite and Mycenaean pottery. Just think of the range of products we already have, and we haven't even started yet. The Uluburun ship's cargo contained other items. Ebony. Tropical products from Africa, products from Egypt, the eastern Mediterranean coast, the Greek mainland, and the Aegean, Cyprus, and even some copper from Sardinia. The ship also had aboard the possessions of its crew. The Uluburu shipwreck is a remarkable reflection of the international nature of eastern Mediterranean trade in Mycenaean times. And this wreck is a catalyst. Now we understand why the great powers competed so vigorously for control of the eastern Mediterranean shore. Why? Why? Because it lay at the heart of a maze of land-based and seaborne trade routes. Trade routes from donkey caravans that brought trade objects from Mesopotamia. Copper from inland. And the shape of the copper ingots is such that they can be stacked easily in saddles on donkeys or packs. And the sheer richness of the Uluburun cargo shows that this competition was working. The wealth must have been enormous. And in fact, Bass has speculated George Bass has speculated that the Uluburun cargo was a royal cargo, perhaps a gift to another monarch.
which happened to perish on in a squall. The loss must have been huge. This international trade reflected in the Uluburan ship, which is a remarkable archaeological discovery by any standards, was still expanding rapidly when Hittite and Mycenaean civilizations collapsed in about 1200 BC in that period of instability coinciding with the Sea Peoples. Now this trade had another effect. It played a major part in the spread of a new metal, in the spread of iron tools and weapons and ironworking technology across the eastern Mediterranean. Copper is an ornamental metal. Bronze is a fighting metal and a metal that was used to make agricultural tools. Iron is the metal of the warrior, the metal of the farmer, a utilitarian metal which made tough working edges and was to revolutionize both warfare and farming. We know that iron was first smelted in the middle of the second millennium BC, perhaps in the highlands immediately south of the Black Sea. Now the Hittite kings realized immediately that this new metal had many advantages, for its sharp, tough working edges were invaluable for weapons and for farming and woodworking, and of course they realized, being a militaristic civilization, the great strategic advantage of iron. They are known to have parceled out gifts of iron very sparingly to other monarchs. There is a blade of native iron in a dagger in Tutankhamun's tomb. Now one of the advantages of iron was that iron ore sources are very abundant, unlike copper and tin. So it rapidly, once the technology spread, once the techniques of making iron tools became known, the technology spread rapidly over a wide area of Europe and Southwest Asia, initially as a prestigious metal, and it was some time before both domestic implements like axes and hoes were made with the new technology. It was predominantly a strategic metal at first. After 1200 BC, as iron was becoming more common, repeated migrations of foreigners flowed into Turkey from the northwest, disrupting life within the Hittite Empire and then in Greece. Rebellious vassals of the Hittites, like the strategic trading city Ugarit, immensely wealthy, which was really under the Hittite sphere of influence in the eastern Mediterranean world, divided up by the Hittites and the Egyptians, threw off the Hittite yoke, yoke and rebelled. This was merely symptomatic of a much larger problem. The eastern Mediterranean world collapsed in chaos as the great powers either fell apart, were seriously weakened, or, like Egypt, withdrew into themselves. Inevitably and eventually, economic recovery came in the hands of the Phoenicians, consummate traders from the eastern Mediterranean whose ships traveled the length and breadth of the Mediterranean. This was a new world of the Assyrians and the Persians, of classical Greece, the Etruscans, and eventually Rome when the Mediterranean was linked from one end to the other by highly intricate mercantile ties which drew both Europe and North Africa into a long civilized universe. And this also was the milieu from which Western civilization emerged. In this lecture and its immediate predecessors, we have described the growth and emergence of a complex Eastern Mediterranean world. A world that began with the development of the Sumerian city-state, 
and the patchwork of small kingdoms of Mesopotamia, which struggled again and again to become larger kingdoms, even near empires, which were linked by trading connections, which eventually extended as far as the eastern Mediterranean coast onto the Iranian plateau, and eventually made contact with the Havapan civilization of the Indus Valley, which we'll talk about later. It was an increasingly international world. And then in the Nile, you have Egyptian civilization, conservative but changing, much more stable, although it had its periods of confusion, which endured for some 3,000 years with ancient religious beliefs that thrived and survived into classical times and even beyond. The rule of divine kings, a unified linear kingdom which was gradually and inexorably drawn into the wider world of the Eastern Mediterranean. A world in which the Egyptians had a great deal of clout because of their wealth in gold. And their connections with Nubia and tropical Africa. But it was a world which increasingly was dominated by traders and by soldiers. And in the case of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, you find the consummate traders taking maximum advantage of their world in which interconnectedness was the key to survival, cashing in on their seafaring skills, cashing in on their ability to produce large quantities of wine and olive oil, their potting abilities, which enabled them to transport this commodity, the timber which abounded on Crete, and these commodities for which the world was hunger, cir hungry circulated through the eastern Mediterranean world on trade routes by sea and land, which outlasted the reigns of individual monarchs, the rise and fall of kingdoms large and small, because for all the volatility of ancient civilizations, the rise of the Assyrians, the rise of the Babylonians, and their abrupt collapse, the caravans that carried the essential commodities of the ancient world, timber, metal, pottery, olive oil, wine, and so on, continued. Caravans that went by land, across deserts, looking neither left nor right, connecting people who might politically be enemies, who all knew that the mechanisms of trade had to continue whatever the politics. Societies with radically different religions and way of governing themselves, divine kings in Egypt, powerful secular lords in Mesopotamia, chieftains who reigned from palaces in Mycenae and Crete. But all of them together, cooperating, interacting in a world which was becoming more and more interdependent. And this interdependency, as we will see later in this course, was to extend into the Indian Ocean, into Southeast Asia, and as far as China, linking vast areas of the world in what I would call a web of interconnectedness. And this interconnectedness is the big message of the story of the early civilizations. They began independently, but gradually and inexorably, they were brought closer and closer together into a world where there were more people living, where the deeds of one state had an impact on the fates of others. A volatile world, a world where everything was powered by human hands, not by fossil fuels, where communication was still simple, a world of pre-industrial civilizations. And out of this crucible, which is a word I use many times in this course, of innovation and trade and competition, were forged the roots of Western civilization. In the rest of this course, we move out of this rather familiar Eastern Mediterranean world to explore states in other parts of the world, in South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and in the Americas. In this lecture, we've described Mycenaean civilization. We've described the Uluburan ship, the Hittite civilization, and the rise of iron. In part five, we're going to go into the Asian civilizations, because part four ends with this lecture with our journey through the very earliest civilizations. In part five, we go to Asia, which developed during the heyday of the 
Mediterranean states, civilizations distinctive and different, adapted to the unique circumstances of their own environments, developing their own religions, their own environments, our own solutions to problems of their environments, and then gradually the interconnection with the wider world developing over many centuries.